All right, uh, good morning. Um, we'll try to start more or less on time because we have a group of people in Kabul who were keeping up late. Uh, a, few, a few housekeeping announcements. This event relied on the success of two technologies, uh, aviation technology and communication technology. We'll see in a minute if the communication technology works, but I can tell you that the aviation technology uh, has already failed. Um, we had hoped to bring Andrew Wilder and Glenn Cohen fresh from Kabul, directly from the airport this morning, with the mud of uh, Afghanistan still on their shoes uh, in a dramatic entrance. But unfortunately, their plane uh, had to return to Dubai last night. Um, so I've kindly asked Hamid Arsalan from the National Endowment of Democracy to, to, to join us as well. Um, and Jed Ober from Democracy International to sort of sit in for Glenn. Uh, Peter Manikis, who was always on the agenda, who was in Kabul just before the election, who uh, uh, luckily uh, uh, is part of the original program um, to be here. Um, so that's the, the, the housekeeping. Thanks to all of you for showing up. I think that uh, without preempting too much of the discussion, it was a interesting and surprisingly positive day in Afghanistan over the weekend. We've tried to time this event so that uh, it will be among the earliest impressions. Um, I hope there's enough information to talk about. Uh, we'll, we'll soon find out, but certainly there are indications about turnout, there are indications that candidates have made certain statements. We'll try to go through all of that, and we'll try also to give an impression or, or, or a, a sense of what direction we're going in, uh, where is this leading, uh, and, and, uh, and what are the issues that we need uh, to watch out for in the future. Um, the format of this event, uh, after I stop talking in about 15 seconds, we'll go straight to uh, Kabul. You should be able to see on the screen um, our four guests there. Shamamud, the USIP's uh, country director, will introduce the panelists in Kabul. I'll ask them to each speak for about five to seven minutes. Then I might ask a few questions from a moderator's point of view. Then we'll go straight to this panel, and then we'll open it up to you. Technology permitting, we expect our guests in Kabul to be here for the full two hours, so you will have a chance to ask them specific questions if you want to uh, once we get through uh, all of the panelists. And again, I think we'll try to be uh, not, not just brief and succinct, but also not too repetitive. Um, but again, that will depend on how much I suppose there is to say at this point, which we're, we're about to find out. So, Shamamud, can you hear us? Yes, I do. Thank goodness. Okay, we can see you. <laughs> okay. Um, why don't you go ahead then and introduce the, the panelists on your side, and, um, uh, and, and, and we'll start uh, from Kabul. Okay, thank you very much, Scott, and also good morning to all uh, uh, friends and audiences there. Uh, we have uh, our three distinguished uh, panelists here is uh, Nawaz Nadiri, he's uh, chairman of FIFA, Free and Fair uh, Election, uh, which is observation organization, and they have uh, around 10,000 observers in the country, and also they release a report today about their observations, and also uh, Nargis Nehan, she's the executive director of Equality for Peace and Democracy, and also Najla Ayubi, she's assistant, uh, she's a deputy uh, director of Isha Foundation, and also she was a judge and former uh, uh, IEC commissioner uh, before, uh, and myself. Uh, before uh, I just go to my uh, panels, uh, I will start uh, uh, with uh, general comments and uh, uh, express my personal views on this uh, election, and then each of our panel members will talk uh, for seven minutes. Uh, as all of uh, you know, in the last three years, USIP was the only organization consistently focused and emphasized on importance of political transition in Afghanistan, and also USIP uh, directed their most of their projects to have a peaceful election in this country. And therefore, I would like to thank all our partners, interlocutors, and they contributed a lot uh, for this election. Uh, on April 5th, uh, which one was one of the best days in the country after so many bad news from Afghanistan in the last few years, 
because this election was better than the election 2009. Many people turned out. According to IEC, uh, about 60% people participated in the election. And also there were uh, several myths uh, dismissed in this election. Afghan defied Taliban threats, uh, show interest in democratization process. They came out to vote despite uh, bad uh, weather and demonstrated that Afghans do care about their own future. Uh, the most slogan I was hearing from the Afghans, the Afghans win and Taliban defeated. This was the theme of the day. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, you know all the candidates in this election also, uh, because they traveled to many parts of the country and they were able to convince the people of Afghanistan, you know, to come out and vote, because they didn't run their campaign just from the behind of the desk or, uh, you know, just by virtual communication. In fact, they traveled to most of the insecure, uh, you know, uh, provinces, and they also need deserve, you know, uh, to be, uh, you know, recognize their contribution. Uh, during election day, uh, we observed election in Kabul and also some of the districts. And most of our staff, uh, you know, they were in uh, Kunduz and also in Ningrahar. And they reported us, and they were also happy about the turnout and participation of the people. And when we talked with uh, uh, voters in the polling stations, uh, most of them, they said this election was better than 2009. Uh, and there was a logistically it was you know uh, better and also there was a transparency in the process. Uh, and also on the election day, uh, IC take action because they closed some of the polling station. Uh, around the number is a little bit we don't have an exact number, but around 350 more or less. Uh, for security reason and also for uh, some uh, fraud and others. Uh, which was, you know, they didn't sit, sit silent and they took actions. Uh, uh, as a, you know, preliminary result, uh, when we just, uh, you know, received from uh, some of the campaign headquarters, from the media reports, and from our contacts in the provinces. Uh, so, this two things that happened in this election. One was, uh, you know, the people, uh, it seemed, they rejected the status quo and also they rejected the world god leadership in the country. Uh, as far as I see from provinces where I am from uh, in Kunar, uh, and people just voted for change and somehow. Uh, uh, and also they wanted to have, you know, uh, most of the theme was on issue basis, you know, better education, better life, good governance, and so many other things has also contributed in this election cycle. Uh, also, the confidence of the people on national security institution, you know, enhanced or boosted, you know, uh, uh, their confidence uh, on the NSF uh, because people now see they are able to protect them and also to provide reasonable security in the country. Of course, uh, there is a lot of challenges existing in the country. Uh, but also there was a, you know, security incidents happen in the country. It was around 400 different kind of incidents happen in the country, but still it was a lower than uh, 2010 uh, elections, uh, according to some uh, sources from security institutions. Uh, despite uh, optimism and good turnout and well preparation by IEC, uh, Independent Election Commission, over 3,000 complaints are lodged by presidential information consul candidates to Election Complaint Commission, which is uh, still is a big number. Uh, Mr. Nadri will talk uh, later on, uh, according to their organizations, 11,000 frauds are reported in different parts of the country. So I believe uh, the fraud uh, may not damage the tenacity of the election because of high turnout and people participation. Uh, as far as I am in contact with various IEC and ECC uh, individuals, uh, I believe they have a determination to review all these complaints 
uh, seriously, and also they gave a press conference, uh, the chairman of the IEC and ECC today. Uh, they just gave a press conference and also uh, they mentioned, you know, they will uh, truly investigate and bring transparency to the process. Uh, uh, because this is uh, very important for, uh, uh, you know, future uh, process in the country if they just, you know, truly investigate, uh, uh, you know, these uh, allegations. Uh, okay, sorry, we were just... Seeing that technology is not working sometimes. Oh, you're back, you're back. Okay. Uh, and so this is uh, you know, good for the future, uh, you know, election and also participation of the people. If they deal with these uh, fraud uh, or allegation or complaints in a transparent way, because that is uh, important for the future of uh, uh, democratic process in the country. Uh, last, uh, I believe the people of Afghanistan voted under the high security threat and inclement weather in most part of the country. Therefore, the people of Afghanistan deserve that their vote should be counted because that is a, a desire of the people and this should uh, happen uh, here. Um, so I believe uh, media organization also played an important role in this election in the awareness and civil society and uh, and everybody played their part in this election. Uh, that was all from my side. Okay, who's uh, who's next? Next, uh, Nadir Nadri. Scott, good to no, good to hear you. That I can't see you anymore. We, we um, can see you. Uh, uh, good, good morning to, to everybody. Scott, uh, we have had a few weeks back uh, a glass half full discussion mm -hmm. somewhere in Europe. And the survey that we, as the Free and Fair Election Foundation, released uh, some two weeks before the election, it was indicating that 76% of people are intending to participate in elections. And a large number of those we have talked to of the country uh, around 92% say they prefer a peaceful democratic transition of power to election and therefore they do support elections. And it was an overwhelming uh, support. A lot of people were looking to these findings with a level of caution and a level of uh, uh, uncertainty or, or, or not taking it uh, uh, immediately. What happened on the 5th of April has proved most of those uh, uh, skepticals or cynics about Afghans not uh, uh, embracing democracy, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also those who were not believing that in the midst of a war, in the midst of violence, people will go out and vote. Uh, we at FIFA now, our observation mission, believes that despite all the threats, despite all the uh, uh, challenges that were out there, the electoral environment on the day of election presented a credible uh, 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 environment for an election. This election, we think, are notably uh, 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 marked by a notably high voter turnout compared to what we had in 2009. Around 7 million or over 7 million people uh, voted. Of course, there are some fraudulent votes. Those need to be cleaned up. Uh, uh, but still, this will be, this will be a higher uh, uh, percentage. We are uh, very much mindful of the irregularities and some of the security challenges that were there that affected some polling stations, but we also, as, a, as an observation organization, we believe that the election uh, presented an improved electoral uh, 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 preparation, which everybody was expecting in Afghanistan to see this election to be uh, a better one. An important characteristic of the April 5 election was the higher turnout of women and also men in some of those remote and rural areas which the participation in the previous election was very, very low. And the higher level of turnout in those places is also one of the important characteristics of, of this election. Uh, FIFA's election observation mission also noted that the participation of public 
was much more meaningful this time. It was not only to go and cast a vote for a presidential or provincial candidate. Many people in long queues, in a very difficult uh, 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 climatical uh, 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 condition, rain and, and in some places even snow, uh, they told our observers that it's not for them to come and just cast a vote. For them, it means to add an additional part also, one that they want to show a clear commitment and testimony by their presence in these long queues, a commitment to a democratic path, to a peaceful path of transition, a transfer of power. The second one, which was also very significant and important, people showed a message of defiance to the violence, to the terrorists, and to the Taliban. And with, the, with this large turnout, people clearly said no to the Taliban. And of course, it's so clear now that it was the Taliban who have lost uh, 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 against the, 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 the very great will of the, uh, of the majority of the public. We do see also a higher degree of public engagement. We have we witnessed an extensive and live coverage of the uh, voting process from major parts of the country and on, on, on live, uh, uh, minute by minute, by a large number of uh, traditional media uh, networks and also also social media on election day. We also mark uh, uh, the, the, the larger number of uh, election monitors, observers, candidate agents. All of this created a situation including uh, an ability of the election commission to provide information on timely manner uh, that this election uh, was in many ways uh, more transparent than what we had in 2009-2010 and was also uh, uh, therefore uh, 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 had uh, a better indicators, if not a full free and fair, but uh, 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 a better improvement or improvement toward those those indicators. However, there are a lot, large, uh, a long list of irregularities. Uh, on the day of election, we have received uh, 11,000 of issues that were reported to us, out of which we have, in the past few days, we have looked into carefully and followed up and verified around 2,600 of them are issues that need to be carefully looked at it. We specially uh, uh, presented to uh, IECC and IEC uh, uh, issues that are uh, of, of importance, and those are not in and in terms of its scale, it's not as large as it was in 2009. And in, again, in terms of its nature, it's not going to, at this stage, what we know, is not going to significantly uh, affect uh, 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 the result of election. One of the, the main issues, I, I will present a few of them, there are a number of them, but I will present a few of them. One of the issues that created already uh, uh, political rhetorics by different uh, uh, candidates is the shortage of ballot paper on the election day. Our observers reported around 7,000, more than 7,000, uh, 700, sorry, more than 700 stations run out of ballot, out of which 270 of them run out of ballot, but around either between 10 and 11. At the early morning, there were stations where our observers were not allowed. Now we have drawn a correlation between observers not allowed and in this 270 polling stations where the ballots ran out in the early morning. Any calculation will tell you that this is not possible, that 600 ballot paper would run uh, so quickly out uh, in uh, 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 and a station to run out of ballot paper uh, just in a in, in few hours. Now we have. I strictly ask the IECC to, to make sure that there is an investigation on those. But overall, all of these 700 plus polling sites running out of paper, pe people standing for hours on queues waiting for paper to come back, uh, indicated a, a good number of people were disenfranchised. Um, and therefore, we called on IEC uh, that the public deserves both an apology for this, but also a proper investigation on what, uh, uh, has, uh, 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 what was the reasons and what were the decisions and why those decisions were resulted to find out the main causes. An independent committee we asked to be formed to investigate uh, 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 that issue. Now, in terms of the major uh, uh, election uh, uh, laws violation and irregularities, we have looked into the issues we have seen and the age votes, 
a, a large number of underage boats in almost a thousand stations we have observed. We've seen around 500 stations where proxy votes on behalf of women were costed. And we've also seen uh, uh, intimidation votes, uh, of course, by the Taliban, which affected around 400 stations on the day of election to be, uh, to be, uh, to be closed. But we've also seen uh, intimidation by powerful figures who tried to intimidate both voters and, and uh, 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 the poll workers. Uh, but the most important one are the ballot stuffing. Uh, we have looked at uh, at least uh, close to 150 polling stations where we documented some of them uh, that where uh, 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 boxes were stuffed, uh, uh, um, and, and those are subjects uh, uh, for, for full investigation. All in all, uh, with all these issues that exist, which we were expecting much more, uh, but taking the turnout, taking the better preparation, uh, knowing that the chairman of the election commission has kind of tried to emerge out of this as a uh, 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 little bit more effective than what was expected, uh, 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 and what the people of Afghanistan have demonstrated on that day is presenting both an opportunity for us as Afghans that the next government will certainly become more accountable because it is a very heavy burden of a popular demand of the public. And people will not be quiet, and they now understand and know how important their role is and how meaningful their participation will. And the second one, it's a clear indication of this 12 years or 13 years of this partnership of Afghans with its international partners. Uh, uh, I think we all should be proud of what we have achieved, and I think those audience sitting this morning in, in, in Washington should also uh, uh, be proud of this. Their contribution is clearly there, and a democratic Afghanistan where it will uh, 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 try and, and, and thrive. To, to become a, a, a democratic state, uh, if not very soon, but in the path to become an institutionalized democracy. And I will stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Scott? Yep. Uh, Najla, we will talk for some minutes. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I think uh, most of the positive things have been covered by uh, my colleagues here, uh, but I would like to just uh, put a few uh, more on, uh, on the positive points, and then I will go to some of the concerns that we have. Uh, one of the issues that I would like to highlight here, the, the presence of the uh, security forces, more than 400 security forces, including uh, Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police, and Afghan um, uh, 400,000, sorry. Yeah, uh, they were uh, out there and they uh, already prepared for the good security for the uh, people who, who could go and, and vote for the, for the election. This is one of the highlights I, I would like to mention. The second is, the, um, uh, as my colleagues mentioned, that uh, the, the huge participation and the mass participation of the people, which 58 percent of the people who participated uh, in the election, and uh, which is 35 percent of them are women which is um, in the history of uh, our election in the post-Taliban. This is the first time that we have seen that the women are participating in, the, in such a um, uh, mass uh, way. Um, uh, another point that I would like to mention is the people of Afghanistan uh, uh, came into the stage just to say no to violence, and they decide that they don't have any alternative to the election and specifically the peaceful uh, transformation of the power from one um, government to another one. Uh, this is also something that uh, uh, is very, uh, very promising. Uh, one more thing I would like to mention, that the uh, massive participation of the men and women in the country, uh, and also uh, having huge number of uh, domestic uh, observers and as well as international observers, um, I think this brings more legitimacy to the, the new administration. And uh, which we didn't have in the 2009 election because we had the persuasion was low as well as the legit legitimacy of the government uh, in 2000, uh, 2009 was under their under caution and also people were questioning. Uh, 
the media took a very huge uh, uh, role uh, in the uh, raising awareness, uh, putting the specific, uh, preparing specific programs for the uh, for the uh, uh, candidates as well as for the people, uh, how they could, I mean, uh, present their um, policies and programs for their future administration. Uh, these were, I think, um, uh, the, the most issues, but uh, one of the issues that I would like to mention as part of the intimidation of the, during the election day, um, I would like to um, uh, make one story from Kabul, uh, from um, the area, where, where there was uh, um, a female uh, reporter from one of the private media uh, uh, organizations. Uh, she was reporting some of the frauds and some of the violations was made by uh, some of the powerful people. And then she was stopped to not report uh, all of these, and she was intimidated. Uh, they were intimidating her and threatening her uh, of, uh, because of uh, that she should not uh, report these frauds. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, it's happening even in, in Kabul, where uh, lots of observers there, and also lots of um, media uh, and other uh, uh, stakeholders were there. Um, as another side mentioned about the shortage of the ballot paper in the, some of the uh, polling centers, I think uh, from technical point of view, I think this is a very difficult to, um, uh, I mean, solve this problem uh, by the by the election commission because we don't have a voter list uh, in the in the provinces in the in the district at the district level, and that's why it's very difficult to find, um, uh, I mean, to find out whether the people uh, who choose to go to which polling center or polling station to vote um, first. In the second, uh, the polling station that. Uh, those are more than seven. There is more than 700 or 600 voting. Then these polling stations should be investigated in the coming future. Uh, one more thing that I would like to mention about uh, what makes us worry about the counting and security of the ballot paper and the result. This is also something that we have to, and maybe the, not only the uh, IEC, also the other stakeholders around, they have to uh, uh, take this uh, very serious and also the government of Afghanistan to put lots of, lots of efforts to make these um, uh, ballot paper, because we don't know uh, what will be the first uh, uh, result of the uh, of the election, but maybe for the recounting and also for the some reviewing will be uh, much easier for for uh, to to maybe uh, bring more um, uh, I mean credible result. The coordination between the IEC and ECC uh, also another concern that we don't know whether. The ECC and IEC have a, a very, um, I mean, tight coordination of their decisions because sometimes you never know what will be the uh, decision of the IEC, which it will, if it will not match to the ECC decisions, then this will be also another problem in the future uh, uh, for the dispute uh, uh, resolution of the uh, election-related issues. Um, uh, also, uh, there is also another point that um, uh, it's a bit boring as uh, of the political disputes. If we are uh, turning out, turning to the uh, political dispute, uh, this will be a difficult uh, situation for us in the future. If uh, if there will be a, a political dispute, which two, I'm sure that there will be two, um, uh, two uh, candidates that they will be having a high level of vote, then uh, if the political dispute will happen, then we have to prepare ourselves how to solve this problem in the coming future. Uh, oh, another point that I would like to mention about the uh, maturity of the uh, candidates, uh, I mean political maturities and also the level of tolerance that they have to, um, I mean, uh, we have to think how, uh, we have to prepare ourselves, how the maturity, that how these uh, candidates will be taking the results of the election in a more mature way, in a very uh, calm way. 
to to be acceptable uh, to accept the result of the election. These are the issues that uh, it's really uh, uh, the matter of the concerns for us. But um, I'm sure that because the people decided to to vote, and I'm sure that if they are not performing, uh, even as uh, one of these candidates, the, the leading candidates candidates will take over the uh, the new government. If they are not performing well, I'm sure that the, the people of Afghanistan got to that level of maturity to um, to make them accountable, because they have come, uh, despite of all of these threats, uh, all of these uh, climate problems and all of these uh, social problems, they came out and they cost their work. I think I will stop also here and I will uh, let Mir say thank you. Okay, let me just pause to say that the, the full bios of the speakers, uh, for those in Washington, are, are outside. That was Najla, who is the Deputy Country Representative of Asia Foundation. And now I guess we go to Nargis, the founder of Equality for Peace yeah. and Democracy. Okay, Nargis Nahan, okay. Um, good evening, colleagues from Kabul. Uh, I think everything is almost covered by my two colleagues, actually nothing is left for me to say. <laughs> but a couple of highlights I want to make about overall uh, election. Uh, I remember it was, um, um, I think, 14 months or 15 months before that uh, I myself was um, in D.C. And there was a roundtable discussion hosted by USAID that we had to have a discussion, mainly focusing on presidential election in Afghanistan. And interestingly, there were so many experts, and I'm sure uh, still there are many of them, that uh, they had their own theories about Afghanistan, that Afghanistan is a very conservative society, and as well as, well as in, like, with all the challenges that we have, somehow they thought and they concluded that you know, Afghanistan really does not want to uh, move forward towards part of democracy and they do not want to have elections. And in like, it's a conservative society anyway, and they believe in, like, in tribal issues and all those in like, ethnicity divisions and these things. So that theory was there. I remember a year before when we had discussion about Afghanistan as well as upcoming election. And at the same time, they also had their own assumptions that, first of all, President Karzai will never allow that this election is going to happen according to the Constitution. He will definitely find some way to stay in power. And even if he is going to allow that, since transition is happening, our national security forces will not be able to provide the security that requires overall country so that we can have the election. And even if that happens, then the people will not turn out to actually vote for the next, uh, uh, for the candidate. So those assumptions were all there, and I remember how tough it was for all Afghans, uh, as in, like, as uh, trying to advocate that we have to have election, because it's going to be the first time uh, peaceful trans, uh, transfer of power between one, uh, from one elected president to other one. It was really tough and difficult, and we ourselves really didn't know that, you know, how we are going to arrange everything. But at the same time, uh, I believe that, you know, like all those pressures was there, and especially all these programs of interactions that we had through media, social media, traditional media, as well as all these conferences that we had, where we kept on discussing about all these issues, trying to make the case for Afghanistan, and at the same time, from time to time, uh, we were challenging ourselves the process, as well as we were being challenged by others. I think that level of awareness in, like, made all of us realize that we have to do something, and this upcoming election is actually going to be in like an example where actually we'll be able to prove to the rest of the world that like actually we deserve to move towards in like democracy or not. So with regard to that, I think like that awareness and all these discussions really made a huge difference. And then we saw that in like actually Afghanistan, which everybody was seeing already in like as a failed project, try to actually in like on fifth appeal, we, we the people managed more than seven hundred but seven point five million managed to come together actually and in like bring a totally new narrative and perspective about, uh, about Afghanistan. First of all we saw that in like Karza really stood to his promise. He had the election on fifth uh, uh, April according to the constitution. And as well as constantly he had the meeting and he was coming out on public and T V and encouraging people that they have to vote. On the other hand, in comparison to last time, where actually we had 32 candidates, this time we had nine candidates, where actually they did not even sit in Kabul and just like encourage people through media to vote. They all went. 
they all went to uh, um, to different provinces, and you saw that you know, they were bringing thousands of people together, presenting their programs to them, having interactions with them, and encouraging them that you know, they have to vote. And at the same time, they decided that personally they are not going to attack each other, and they are just going to focus on their program. We also saw the very uh, positive uh, and effective role that media played as well as the civil society in terms of raising awareness of the people, making them realize the importance of the election, and the important role that people can play, and without their uh, participation, they like, it's not going to be effective. The role of Afghan National Security Forces was, was amazing. I think this is the first time we managed to prove that actually even after a military transition, Afghanistan is going to be a secure country if we manage to provide financial uh, support to Afghan National Security Forces as well as technical support. The Independent Election Commission that all of us were very much concerned about their dependency and as well as partiality actually proved themselves that you know, they so far stayed impartial and tried to deliver much more in like, than what we were expecting from them. The Complaint Commission is trying their level best. They already had several meetings with the candidates' representatives trying to get all the complaints, and now we're watching how they're going to respond to all of them. So I think everybody, if you look at the structure, if you look at participation of people, and if you look at them uh, for a, a contribution of and as well as the, the debates that we had and the role which are being played by different uh, stakeholders actually managed to bring all these pieces together and really made the you know, 5th April a successful day for all of us. That actually after, uh, uh, first of all, the turnout was so much that besides uh, ballot papers being actually finished in most of the uh, uh, centers, actually also, they had to extend the voting timing for another hour because they knew that in many places people uh, people still will be coming will be coming and voting, and at the same time, in like the social media, in like played a really important role as well as traditional media. The whole day, uh, radio channels, TV channels, and people were on even on Facebook and Twitter tweeting to each other and talking about the election, reporting about irregularities, and in like praising rule of uh, national security forces, and that actually actually managed to minimize the gap between national security force and people where actually they saw that how much support they have for the, uh, from the people. And especially with all those uh, incidents of uh, attacks that we had in like all around the country, and especially Serena one, where actually Taliban clearly said that you know, whoever is going to come out of their house, they vote, that is what's going to, going to happen to them. But still 7.5 million came to bring like, out and you know, they voted, and that was a very clear message to Taliban that you know, they are the history, they are not relevant anymore. But at the same time, there was also like a, a, a master to the international community that we as people of Afghanistan actually, we proved that you know, we believe in the democracy, and even at the cost of our lives, we came out and we voted. Now the time has come that we have to sit once again, and then we have to talk about long-term partnership. So I think like all these things, and then the other thing that I'm sure you saw that besides all these taxes that we had, uh, now, there was talking to you about all those irregularities and complaints that were there. Najula John talked to you about um, about all those concerns that she was having. And that shows that still, in, like, we have the bar quite high in terms of quality. And, in, like, we want to make sure that all the in, like, uh, participation of people and all the factors that we have is not going to overshadow those irregularities that we have. So why is it trying to encourage people that this is still all of us have to stay uh, optimistic? And we also have to encourage international community that they have to see a different picture, bigger picture about Afghanistan. At the same time, we also make sure that in, like, this should not become an excuse that actually we lower the bar in terms of quality of uh, uh, election. But what is in terms of election right now is really important is that you know, I believe that in the whole process, if we divide it into two phases, uh, three phases, I think in terms of preparation, we did really great, all of us. And of course, thanks to you, because without your support, both political and financial, it was not possible. The day of the election went very successful. But now what we have is the completion of the process that how we are going to bring all these results together and make sure that actually the Independent Election Commission and the Complaint Commission are responding to people's demand and then they are delivering and they are maintaining their impartiality. That is the very important part. So like that is the like concern that like we share. Now we are going to watch that out. But of course that's going to be the most challenging part and we hope that we'll be able to come out of that as well successfully. I'll stop here because I'm sure there are lots of questions from your side. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think it's Scott. Yeah, Hey uh, Scott, uh, uh, just uh, I would like to make a one point and then uh, we'll be handed to us. Okay. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, Scott. Uh, I had just uh, one more thing to share. 
Um, maybe uh, one of the, because uh, uh, as an Afghan, uh, this was one of the issues that I would like to mention, that the, the, the full ownership of the process was on the hand of Haska. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another point that we thought uh, that this is uh, the ownership played another role. Uh, we had a support from international community, from uh, from donor community, from from uh, all over the world. But still, uh, we thought that the ownership of the process, uh, whether this was with the election commission, with the civil society, with the uh, with the, I mean, uh, the candidates themselves and agents and media, everyone was, uh, uh, the, the ownership was in the hand of Afghan. That's why maybe this was one of another reason that we succeed to have a, a, a very good election. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's an excellent point. Yes. Carlton, to you. Okay. Like, when, I, I might come back to you. Since the technology is working so far, I think we'll go straight to our panelists here in Washington and then we'll have us. I think I can speak loud enough. We cannot hear you in the Scott. Since the technology is working, uh, we'll go straight to, or what now is, we'll go straight to our panelists in Washington, and if you can hang on in case there are questions. Uh, there are certainly some points that have been raised that I would like to go back to, but I want to first um, give a chance for our panelists here. Um, first, I want to ask Peter Manikis, who's a senior associate at NDI, to make some comments and some reactions. Before that, uh, I did want to point out, as all of you have followed this, that NDI had a particularly difficult time during this election. We've spoken about the risks that Afghan voters faced when they went to the polling station on Saturday, but observers also faced risks, and as we saw, NDI lost one of their experienced observers, Luis Maria Duarte, in the Serena attack that was uh, mentioned by, by Nargis. And what I've heard from a lot of, a fair number of people is that the, the attacks that the Taliban committed before the election, in the two weeks before the election, including the Serena attack, actually had something of a galvanizing effect on the electorate. As we heard from our, our guests in Kabul, people realized this was a opportunity, perhaps the only opportunity they would have in the foreseeable future to make an emphatic point about the kind of Afghanistan they wanted to live in. Um, and what we seem to be seeing is that they, that they use that opportunity really to quite a, a great extent. But with that, uh, Peter, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, NDI's program in Afghanistan really, for the, uh, on election-related matters, really began last December when we fielded a, a pre-election mission there. Uh, we also had trained uh, a number of women political uh, candidates for the provincial council races and had worked with uh, the domestic election monitoring groups, including, in, including FIFA, but also uh, three others. The, the, the hallmark of, of this election is obviously participation. And, uh, you know, there are three times as many do domestic election monitors accredited for this election than there had been in, in 09 and 010. Um, NDI, although we withdrew uh, some of our international long-term uh, observers after the attack at, at the Serena, um, we did field 101 Afghan staff observers that had worked uh, for NDI in the past in, in 2009 and 2010, and they managed to get to 26 of the, uh, the provinces in, Af in Afghanistan. Um, I, I think, as Scott mentioned, the, the, the attacks in the pre-election period, and particularly the attack on the Serena, really motivated a number of the Afghans, particularly those on our staff who knew uh, um, Luis Maria Duarte well. And I, I think they wanted to make this effort uh, as a demonstration of, uh, of, their, of their commitment uh, to move this process forward. And, and as I said, sort of in, in, in honor of the, the, the loss of life that uh, Luis and, and, uh, and others had uh, experienced. It was a particularly violent uh, pre-election period, which makes the, uh, uh, the, the relative uh, quiescence of the, of, of the election so, so much more stark. Um, our observers found uh, many of the same things that you just heard from uh, the, 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 the panel in Kabul. Um, there were long lines uh, around the country, virtually in every of the provinces that, that, that we observed in. Um, they saw a lot of women, uh, and they saw a lot of younger people. 
um, voting and voting as well. Um, so the, the defiance of, of the, the violence of the, the, the pre-election period and uh, the commitment to moving the democratic process forward, um, I think struck everybody as being sort of the, 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 the hallmarks of the, of the election. Um, th there is a warning, however, that this is not likely to look quite as good as it does today, a few days from now. We've already uh, heard uh, uh, statements from the IEC that, uh, that they are disclosing instances of fraud, and that's likely to, to multiply in, in the days ahead. Um, but still, uh, we're, we're, we're starting from a relatively low base. Uh, I think there's, in the end, going to be widespread agreement that this election was an improvement over 2009 and, and, and 2010, um, which is really critical, I think, for international support um, for the further development of Afghanistan, both politically and, and economically. Um, events, I, I think, I mean, attention is going to quickly turn to the runoff and to the, the, the transition. Um, the large number of polling stations that were closed for security reasons, uh, the, the large number of, uh, of uh, the ballot shortages that we saw are all going to be issues, I think, that are going to be Need to need to be addressed as as the runoff approaches. Um, there are several provinces, particularly like Nangar, uh, had a, a, a very high percentage of the of the, the polling stations closed for security reasons, and uh, a large number of people for both reasons of the ballot shortages and uh, security uh, closings of, of polling stations that are going to feel disenfranchised. And um, it's really going to be important, I think, for the credibility of the runoff that those issues are, are going to be addressed. The, the big issue, I think, to focus on over the next several weeks after the, the runoff occurred is, is uh, the transition itself. Um, you, you face a problem in that it looks like the runoff will actually occur after the uh, expiration of the president's term. Uh, there, there, there's a gap. I've never quite seen a situation like this. Um, there's going to have to be some planning involved with respect to who's going to be uh, holding the reins of power. And, and in, in a presidential election in particular, some planning for a, a, a runoff is, is really desirable. In a parliamentary system, you know, you have shadow uh, cabinets, you have people sort of that are pre prepared to take the reins of power uh, shortly after the election occurs. That's not usually the case in presidential races. Um, it would be, I think, very fruitful for the government, at least, to start planning now in regard to how they're going to switch over the ministries to the, the incoming government. Probably too much to ask for the candidates at this point that are preparing for a runoff to start putting together transition teams and naming the people that would likely be named to a cabinet. But the government at least uh, could start preparing by developing memo, uh, uh, memos for each of the ministries in regard to uh, what the pressing issues are and, uh, and what matters are going to need to be addressed. Uh, very quickly. It would also, I would really encourage the civil society organizations to start preparing lists of, of people that could fill sub-cabinet positions uh, for the new government, particularly women. I think it would be terribly useful for uh, some civil society organizations to start developing a list of women that would be um, eligible for, for uh, high positions in, in, in the next government. I think that would be very useful to the, to the incoming government. Um, but, you know, again, I think everybody feels very good about this, although, uh, um, you know, we're, we're starting from uh, a, a relatively low base. But it, it's, it's still a very good, uh, I think, sign for Afghanistan's future. Uh, Jed is the director of programs for Democracy International, which has had a program in Kabul for several years now, uh, certainly is one of my regular stops uh, when, I, when I go and visit. Uh, and you also had a team of um, long-term uh, expert uh, observers who were mm -hmm. watching the elections, headed by uh, Glenn, who, as I said before, is 
watching this from Dubai, perhaps. I'm, I'm sure he has wonderful things to say, and when he gets back, he'll share all those with you. Um, well, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, thanks to USIP for putting this together. Uh, and thank you all in Kabul for, for joining us and sharing your uh, initial impressions uh, on the process thus far. Um, we had, uh, Democracy International had a, a, a very small team of international observers uh, that deployed, some of them that deployed around the country, um, but on election day, all, all of our observers observed uh, in Kabul. Uh, our initial impressions are very much consistent with the reports that you've heard. Uh, so in the spirit of not being repetitive, I, I, won't, I won't reiterate all those. I think, you know, one of the, the most important things that, uh, that we've heard thus far is the positive reports from the domestic observation groups uh, that had the luxury of sending so many people around the country uh, like FIFA and like TIFA and some of the other uh, domestic observation groups that are active uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the reports from uh, the partners uh, in Kabul are much more positive than they have been in the past uh, at this stage of the process. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, what comes next. And I think uh, many of us and, and many of you in the room, I'm sure, are familiar with this process. But uh, and, and Peter alluded to the fact that there, there could, in fact, be a, a runoff election. But in the past, it hasn't been exactly so simple to get uh, through uh, that process and to get to that point. Uh, as many of you uh, who, have uh, who have observed these processes know. Uh, so now that uh, Election Day has happened and uh, Afghans have come out and voted uh, enthusiastically, uh, there are really two, you know, many of you are probably wondering why, why does it take so long to get those results? And there are two processes in place right now. Uh, one, a results tabulation process that's managed by the Independent Election Commission and two, a complaints adjudication process that's managed by the Independent Election Complaints Commission. Uh, these processes in the past uh, have been absolutely critical. And like I said, uh, Election Day is, a, is, a, is an extremely important step in the pre-election period, obviously, it was extremely important to, to get to Election Day and for that uh, process to take place uh, successfully on Election Day. But the most critical part of the processes in the past has been the post, uh, immediate post-election period and the results tabulation process and the complaints adjudication process. So the IEC uh, in Kabul, as we speak, uh, are, are, are busy receiving results forms from around the country. Uh, those results forms will be tallied through a tally procedure that's been defined and distributed and, and, and explained publicly uh, in Kabul. Uh, we should have, uh, you know, results start to be announced here in, in, in the coming days. Uh, it, concurrently with that uh, is the complaints adjudication process, uh, which is, you know, absolutely critical uh, to this process. Uh, the ECC, the, the IECC now, uh, will be responsible for categorizing the complaints that they have uh, that have been lodged, uh, and they will categorize as Category A complaints those that could potentially affect the outcome of, of the race. Uh, and those will be the most critical complaints for the, for the Independent uh, Electoral uh, Complaints Commission to review. As those processes unfold, I mean, the, the results tabulation process and the complaints adjudication processes are absolutely critical regardless of uh, how close the race is. But there are two scenarios by which those processes could be, uh, at least two scenarios, uh, by which those processes could be even more important. One of those scenarios is should one candidate actually be close to the 50% threshold to avoid the runoff election uh, that many people have alluded to, many of the panelists have alluded to. Should that be the case, obviously any of the complaints that were lodged with the IECC uh, that could potentially affect the outcome become more important uh, should the uh, percentage be, be low to, to meet that threshold, potentially meet that threshold. Uh, and then any uh, quarantined polling stations uh, that the Indo Independent Collection Commission will, uh, will quarantine stations based on some predefined set uh, cri of criteria uh, that they will then have to uh, or choose to investigate those polling stations further. Uh, should that, uh, should someone, one candidate actually be close to the 50% threshold, obviously that process will uh, 
help determine whether or not there will, in fact, be a runoff election. Uh, the other scenario, I think, is uh, between uh, the second and third candidates. Uh, and should the margin between the second and third candidates in the preliminary results be close, then both the IEC's results tabulation process and the ECC's complaints adjudication process uh, will be critically important to determine uh, who, in addition to the first candidate, will actually participate in that runoff election. Um, so those are two of you know, the, the most, the, those are the two reasons primarily why, uh, you know, it, it, it takes so long to get election results in Afghanistan. Um, and those are the two processes to watch here uh, over the coming weeks. Um, so, and, and it won't be until the conclusion of those processes that we actually know, you know one, who, who will participate in a runoff election, and then two, uh, who eventually will become Afghanistan's uh, next president. Um, so we may, we may not have a winner, uh, you know, for, for quite some time. Uh, and, you know, if one of the two scenarios that I mentioned plays out, uh, I think we can expect that it'll take longer uh, than, than it may otherwise. Uh, but I think that we do have one loser already, and I think that the enthusiasm that we saw on election day, and I think the fact that so many Afghans came out and voted in such large numbers, uh, despite great personal risk, shows that the Taliban strategy to disrupt the election failed, uh, and that the Afghan people are certainly winners in this process. The Taliban uh, are certainly losers in this process. And the fact that, uh, the, that they, had, they, they felt they were compelled to target the process uh, in the pre-election period uh, to the extent that they did, I think shows just how far democracy has come in Afghanistan. And the fact that so many people came out to participate in this election, so many Afghans came out to participate in the election uh, and risked their lives uh, to, cast their, to cast a ballot uh, and to ex exercise their democratic right, shows that today it's much more true that democracy is the path to power in Afghanistan and not war and bloodshed, so. Thanks. Uh, our final speaker, Hamid. Arsalan from the National Endowment of Democracy. I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, and, and point us a bit in the direction of the future. But following up on this point that Jed just made about the fact that the Taliban were the losers and their campaign to disrupt didn't seem to succeed, if there is a second round, what can we expect? Uh, there was almost an element of humiliation in, in the statements people were giving about why they were voting and they were voting against the Taliban. Will there be a redoubled effort if there is a second round? Uh, and, and more generally in the future, where, where are we going uh, in Afghanistan? Well, before addressing those questions, I want to notice and note something that in this panel, I don't know if you guys noticed, the number of Afghans are more than our international <laughs> friends. Twelve years ago, this would have not been probably the case. So I think that's encouraging. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking also USIP and Scott, and uh, by mentioning that it's always beautiful to speak in, at last in such a distinguished panel, because all the hard questions are uh, covered. <laughs> I think I will address that question in three uh, specific parts, and then I will talk about uh, the challenges of uh, hopefully if there is if there is or there isn't a runoff, and for the next administration that may come into power probably in uh, August or September. So. I think the three points that really mobilized Afghans to take part uh, in this elections uh, way more than, let's say, the previous round was one, and uh, the people in 2009, uh, because they knew that Karzai is running and they're dealing with an incumbent president, they would be like, well, why should we participate? You know, he's going to be the next president of Afghanistan anyways. So that really encouraged Afghans to take an active role and like, be really active uh, towards uh, this elections and participate in this huge number. Uh, the second point is that uh, we noticed, you know, a much, much more informed citizenry. You know, that the Afghans were way more informed this time uh, around in elections about their political rights and obligations, that I think I would like to give credit to uh, the international organizations like USIP, NED, NDI, and many other organizations who worked hard during the past years uh, in terms of educating the Afghans about their political rights and obligations, you know, uh, citizen awareness. Um, we have seen, you know, the level of enthusiasm in the debate, especially among the younger generation of Afghans, uh, which, according to some data, you know, uh, nearly uh, over 60 percent of the Afghan population is under the age of 25. They were very engaged in the debates of the presidential ca uh, candidates, questioning them, you know, if you're going to be the next president of Afghanistan, 
what is going to be your, your foreign policy. So that showed to us, you know, that they are not concerned much about the ethnic politics rather than, you know, issue-based politics in, in Afghanistan. The third and the last point, as I think mentioned by our friends in Kabul and as well as you, by you, uh, the recent attack uh, in Serena, especially the death of uh, uh, my friend and our, uh, and our grantee, Sardar Ahmad, and his entire family, you know, uh, with the exception of Abu Zar, who is, I think, a hero in Afghanistan and survived, that really triggered and backfired for the Afghans to say no to tyranny and terrorism represented by the Taliban. And they said that, you know, we are embracing democracy and constitutional order order, and we want to participate fully in these elections. So those were the, the three parts, uh, basically, to answer uh, to your question. As far as uh, for some of the challenges that hopefully if we have a next administration in the next few months in Afghanistan, uh, in my view, we will have, the next administration will have like four key uh, distinct challenges. On the political front, uh, it's extremely important on, uh, to include uh, some representatives from the losing candidate and party uh, because of unity uh, in Afghanistan. So whoever wins the next election, I think that will be their toughest challenge on how to approach them and how to uh, sort of embrace and include them, which both of the leading candidates, both Abdullah and Ghani, they said that if they were to win the next elections, they are ready to include uh, people from the other uh, party as well. The second point is on our bureaucracy. I think for many of the international organizations and many of our international friends, uh, it's obvious that we have a lot of corruptions and like a huge bureaucracy that in most parts it's dysfunctioning, you know, and uh, so that would be really a big challenge that how then, because one other thing that really encouraged Afghans to take part in these elections was, you know, because of the corruption. They were like, you know, we want a next president uh, to address this challenge, to deal with cronyism, nepotism, uh, because most uh, those who are in power in, in the country, uh, they are uh, there based on patrimonial and neo-patrimonial relations, you know, so um, that will be another challenge because a lot of these candidates, they address that we are going to fight uh, against corruption and we want to bring reform. That will be another challenge to materialize on some of those promises for the uh, next president of Afghanistan. A third would be an economy. As many of you know, uh, more than 500,000 uh, youth or individuals are adding every year, according to the recent data by the World Bank, to the Af Afghanistan's workforce. So uh, job opportunities and providing uh, opportunities of uh, e e economy would be a really, really uh, tough challenge for the next president as well. And the last point is on foreign policy. As uh, uh, all of you know, uh, President Karzai refused to sign the bilateral security agreement with the United States. Uh, but uh, the good sign is that most of the leading candidates, uh, both Qani and Abdullah, as well as Rasul, uh, they indicated that if uh, they were to become the next president of Afghanistan, uh, they are going to uh, sign the bilateral security agreement. So Afghanistan, especially the, the, its relationship during the last few years, uh, severely was damaged with the international community, in particular the United States. So the next administration has a tough uh, task ahead to uh, reset these relationships with the international community, especially with the United States, and also to deal with uh, some tough neighbors, you know, uh, Pakistan and Iran, uh, to deal with the Taliban issue, uh, and so forth. So I'll stop here, and uh, we'll open up for, for questions and answers. Thanks, thank, thanks to all of the panelists for, for being uh, thorough and, and not repetitive. There was one point that, that I, I was waiting to hear if it was going to be addressed or not, and I didn't hear it addressed, so I'll, I'll abuse my privilege to make it. And it might seem like a small point, but uh, I actually don't think it is, which is that for the first time in the fabled 5,000 years of Afghan history, an election has been held according to the constitutional timeline. Every presidential election and parliamentary election that we've held in the past, the, the two presidential, the two parliamentary, the two provincial council elections, have all been held in the fall, whereas the Constitution calls for them to be held uh, in the spring. So you could technically argue that every election has been illegal in some sense. Uh, and there was a big concern about whether or not weather would be a massive factor um, in this election. But it was organized on time. It was held on time. It proves that it can be done. Uh, and, and really, the weather, despite the bad weather on the day of the election and, and the rain, uh, the weather was the dog that didn't bark. Uh, and I think that's tremendously important for the future planning of elections. If I may add one last point. Um, 
uh, I grew up in Afghanistan, so I, I remember the Soviet time, Russians, uh, the Taliban, and as a kid, our games was, you know, to play probably with fake tanks and uh, fake guns or whatever. Some of you may have seen this uh, picture who, uh, that is viral now on Facebook that the next generation of Afghans, the kids, uh, they are playing uh, the democracy and, and voting game, you know, to go and, like, they paint their finger and they go and they try to, you know, participate in, 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 in. So that really gives me hope that Afghanistan is heading to a bright, bright future. Yeah, when I first saw that picture, I forgot to read the caption. I thought it was underage voters lining up. To... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shah Mahmood, can you hear us? Shah Mahmood? <laughs> He's we get it? All right, listen, well, let's open up the, uh, uh, the f questions to all of you in a democratic spirit. We'll try to get um, our, our uh, smartphone people in Kabul uh, back on the line in case you have questions for them. But um, we should any wave questions? Our hands. We should, yeah, I'll try. I'll try. Uh, where are our microphones? Oh, hold on. Uh, we'll start with you, David. There's a, there's a microphone coming in. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, David Sedney. Uh, first, uh, beyond uh, the central congratulations to the Afghan people and the Afghan security forces, Scott, I'd like to thank and congratulate you at USIP both for putting this forum on and for uh, having your advisors, uh, both Shah Mahmood and his people on the ground in Afghanistan and Andrew on your team out there. I thought that was tremendously important that you did so and it obviously required uh, a, a deal of courage to do so when so many other advisors left. So congratulations to USIP uh, for your efforts. Uh, in uh, listing the winners and losers, as we love to do in the United States, um, I would add, uh, and I would ask for the panelists' comments, Pakistan is a loser. Uh, because uh, while the Afghan security forces performed very well, they did so in the face of a continuing onslaught of infiltration from Pakistan. All the evidence is that the number of people, the amount of weapons, uh, the amount of uh, explosives that crossed the border in the two months before the election was much higher than, uh, than it had been before. Uh, and that the safety on election day was due to the Afghan security forces. Uh, in the last, and this is a second question and final question for the panel, in the last couple of days, there have been a couple of commentators in Pakistan and a couple in the U.S. who have said that uh, the Taliban did this on purpose in order to uh, uh, give space for the elections. Uh, as far as I can tell, that's not consistent with the facts on the ground, but I'd be very interested in commentary, particularly from your people in the uh, uh, in, in, in Kabul as to just how good were the Afghan security forces. Was this a victory for the Afghan security forces or was it restraint by the Taliban? Thank you. All right, let me, Shah Mahmood, can you hear us? At the moment. Please try again later. <laughs> We're sorry, you're caught. <laughs> well, <clears throat> this is a danger of these kinds of events, but <laughs> we'll try to get them back. But and that was really on the point. Please try later. <laughs> Please, yeah. Uh, in the meantime, any, any, anybody want to volunteer some responses uh, to those questions from this side? Uh, I, I think, you know, to a large part, I would like to give credit to the Afghan National Security Forces, especially since the surge, uh, like, and since the transition periods, the areas that even uh, were taken when the, the national troops were on the ground as well. It was the NSF that they approached and they took those areas back. And this time around, there was a much, much better coordination between the Independent Election Commission and the security forces, especially the way they, like, sort of divide the layer, uh, the, the, the security for, uh, apparatus in the three-layer forces involving NDS to detect some of these attacks from happening and also engaging the uh, police and, and the army. So um, I think they did a phenomenal job in, in terms of providing the security during the day of the elections. And to a large credit, we should also give them credit that going through the campaigning period, you know, we could see that they are really in control. Uh, thousands of people in the rallies in Kandahar, for example, they came out to support their candidates and other provinces. So it really uh, boosts the confidence of the people to uh, trust their security forces that, you know, they can provide our security and then that leads to probably more engagement. Uh, just as a broader point, the, the, the narrative of 
Pakistani officials is, is some, somewhat frighteningly um, uh, distorted, it would seem to me. I mean, I, I think what you're referring to is probably an example of, 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 of their wanting people to believe that the Afghans really couldn't protect themselves, and this was a gift from the Taliban. Um, I've also heard them say that you know, the, the, the election will be rigged by Mr. Karzai and that uh, Ashraf Ghani would get something in the single digits. I mean, it, what, what's concerning about it, I think, is that an, an actor of that importance um, could, could have such a view that sort of uh, departed from reality. That, that, that's very disturbing, I think, because at least you want whatever their, their policy is, you want them to be clear thinking about what the, the actual facts are. All right, let me just add quickly on, on the question of Pakistan, from what I've heard from those who know much more about this than I do, is that at a certain point in the last couple of years, the Pakistan has basically realized that uh, the Taliban will not be an instrument which can dominate uh, Afghanistan or pacify it you know, on their behalf or, 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 or in their interests. Uh, and in a bit like everybody else, they were sort of forced to accept the fact that the elections were going to be um, the event that mattered, whether they liked it or not, and they also began to hedge in terms of the elections. Uh, the visits to the Northern Alliance uh, and, and, and other political actors they weren't engaged with uh, up to then. So it might have just been, uh, uh, you know, a sort of pragmatism that they've, you know, that they basically realized that it was in their interest for these elections to go well and for there to be some sort of smooth transition of power. How much influence they have over preventing the Taliban from doing something or not, that uh, is always, you know, the eternal question that is being debated over and over again in many uh, capitals. Uh. A very quick uh, last point on, on, on Pakistan. I think the key point is that Pakistan should change the, the, the way they are looking towards Afghanistan. You know, Afghanistan is never going to go back to where it was in 2001 or 2002. I think they should treat Afghanistan definitely as a strategic partner and as a good neighbor. It's going to be for their benefit as well. Look at the amount of uh, trades that have increased at least during the past decade between the two countries. Uh, yep. Oh, did you want to? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, uh, yeah, for, and, and it always amazes me how quickly a question of, about Pakistan comes up in a, in a panel discussion <laughs> on Afghanistan. Um, and, and we did it on the first question this time. Um, but the, the, the larger uh, question about whether you know this was somehow the Taliban strategy, I think, is is entirely inaccurate. And uh, I think their strategy in the lead up uh, to the election was to be extremely violent. And we saw uh, observers, uh, we saw journalists, uh, we saw election officials uh, lose their lives uh, in the lead up to it. Uh, and the strategy was, uh, the hope was, I think, uh, on the behalf of the Taliban that that would somehow scare uh, the Afghans and the Afghan voters to not participate in this process. Uh, and that didn't play out, so. No. Please. Yeah. Hello, my name is Fariba Parsa. I am a business scholar at George Mason University Center for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. First of all, I would uh, like to congratulate to Afghanistan uh, for election and also congratulations for high number of women who have been elected. If you compare Iran with Afghanistan, in Iran only 3%. I would like to hear um, um, comments from uh, Afghanistan. What are the expectations of women for the new government? Um, is there ex expectation to uh, we see more women in government to have a more important sensitive positions? And what does it mean for women's rights? for the new government. Thank you. Are, are you back online in Kabul? Yes, we do. Oh, did you hear the question? <laughs> no, I, I was not clear. <laughs> OK, the, the, the question are what, are, what are the what are the expectations for women in Afghanistan as a result of this election? Uh, everybody has a high expectation from the next government. 
because to improve governance, to you know, care about women, children, youth, in so many uh, you know issues existing there. Uh, but you know, at the same time, the Afghan understand they are realistic. Uh, what is possible, what is not possible. Uh, but if the next government has a political will to you know uh, to tackle all these issues. Uh, I think people will have a patient to wait, you know. Uh, but uh, Nigel, you can answer the question. <laughs> so it's already a yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> question. Thank you so, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, one of the um, issues that we have faced in the past, uh, uh, the mo most of the elected authorities uh, in Afghanistan uh, in uh, current administration. They gave lots of promises while they were campaigning during their, uh, I mean, during the election. But unfortunately, most of the promises was not kept. But uh, this time, um, there was lots of uh, activities uh, uh, going on before the election. One of them was that uh, most of the women in civil society came together from all over the uh, country, and, and they put their statements and their expectations from the from these uh, uh, candidates. That's why they put their, uh, their expectations and uh, the, uh, the statement, and they asked these candidates to sign uh, at the bottom of all of those expectations. And I'm sure that their, their signatures are there, and I'm sure if they are not, um, if they are not uh, um, responding to those uh, uh, or not keeping their promises, then they will be, uh, 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 they have to be accountable, and these people, mm -hmm. and the women of Afghanistan will make them accountable mm -hmm. for their promises. And um, I'm sure that uh, Nargis John have uh, lots of experience uh, bringing women from the provinces and, um, and talking to them, and they have lots of um, uh, things that they share, and I'm sure that she will contribute to this as well. Um, naturally, women from the center and provinces through several platforms came together, um, and naturally, one of the initiatives which uh, which was supported by USAID was uh, brought, uh, actually we managed to have uh, two uh, women dialogue in the south and north of Afghanistan, where women from 22 provinces came together. And they had two days of full discussion on election challenges, opportunities, and as well as in like their expectation from the future president. Then at the same time, actually, what we did is we reviewed all of them, and then we invited 200 women to Kabul, and we invited all candidates who so actually they directly interacted with them, and they they asked questions, they uh, they as well as presented their expectation to the candidates, and they asked them that you know, like what is going to be their program for women, and they presented their programs and copies of all their manifestos or with us, which are not quite articulated, uh, because it was first an experience for them to actually have you know, like a manifesto for women empowerment. But at the same time, like at least a couple of things which are important about women's political participation, women's civic education, and as well as in like a reduction of violence against women, but something that all of them promise that they are going to work towards that. At the same time, in like with regard to women participation, they, I think like the expectation this time is quite high, because everybody was talking, you know, like about uh, uh, women political participation. At the same time, not being supported by the current administration. That's why this time, 36 percent of you know, like voters are women. That means that this government is going to be absolutely accountable to women, and they cannot deny like, our demands anymore. Uh, so uh, right now, like again, a group of us are discussing that we'll be coming together, preparing ourselves that what exactly and specifically we are going to request and demand from the next administration, that as soon as the, uh, whoever is going to win the election and they take the office, we are going to have an another round of discussions with them, which is going to be presented to them, and then they have to respond to that. So that preparation is in the process. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, my name is Zabiul Anasiri. Uh, first, a quick comment on um, what uh, I think Mr. David Sidney mentioned about uh, the Taliban leading the elections to uh, be held in a, 
secure environment. I would say that the Taliban and the Pakistanis did whatever they could to threaten the people of Afghanistan from going uh, to cast their votes. And one of the examples was uh, during the election day, actually, the Pakistanis, uh, uh, you know, fired several missiles uh, and its shellings over a corner, and uh, as a result, a teenage uh, or 21-year-old uh, uh, boy who was on the way to the voting center to cast his vote was killed. So, and be, before that, the Taliban actually, uh, with their attack uh, on Sirena Hotel, uh, did already whatever they could to threaten the people in order to prevent them from uh, attending in the elections. So I think the credit goes to the people of Afghanistan, the security forces, who were capable to maintain security for the people, and it was the people who said no to the uh, violence and to the Taliban. Now my question goes to uh, the panelists uh, in Kabul, that if the election goes to runoff, uh, how do you see uh, the IEC to um, have preparations to uh, redo the elections. Uh, and also one of the panelists here in Washington said that uh, there will be a gap. The, the president is already out of the office. So with uh, no one leading the administration, uh, how prepared the IEC uh, and the government is to redo the elections? Thank you. Shamu, did, did you hear that? Or? Okay. Yeah, I had a question. Hey, Just I... uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I concur with, uh, you know, the the people have show courage, you know, to come out. And I mentioned in my presentation uh, around 400 incidents has happened. Uh, about 31 people were killed and more than 150 people were injured on the election day. The Afghan Police National Army. But people defied, you know, all the threats, and they just came out. So the credit goes to the Afghan, you have to understand the thing. They tried before the election, during the election, or might do something after the election, but uh, people, you know, show, you know, uh, demonstrated courage in others to come out. Uh, regarding the preparation of IEC, uh, I believe the IEC is ready to, you know, conduct election in two weeks after the final result. Uh, so that will be technically is not a problem, and also we see have to you know uh, uh, conclude uh, you know uh, what's called uh, make a decision about all the complaints, especially about the presidential complaints uh, soon. Uh, according to the timetable, they just distributed. You know, it is possible to have a, a second round election because already the materials of election are in the districts. You know. So they don't need to transport those materials back, like, you know, for booting, you know, paper or some other station, you know, some other thing. They might resupply them, uh, but the only thing is the ballot paper, and uh, it will be between two people. Uh, it will happen maybe in a weekdays or something. Only they are in discussion, they are prepared for that. As far as I talked with the IC executive and chairman yesterday. So they are prepared, uh, prepared for that. And, and, and the second question, what is the, 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 what happens if there's no announcement when the constitutional term of the president expires? No, that is a legal issue because the constitution is not quite clear on that. His term is ending, but there are no mechanisms existing how to do after that, you know? Mm -hmm. But maybe Mr. Nadiri will ask uh, better than me. Can, can, can you also turn the camera so... Uh, we see Mr. Nadri. Thank you. Well, uh, there is uh, the Constitution uh, is, on one hand, very clear uh, that gave the precise date, the first of uh, third month of the solar calendar. The new president will have to take uh, uh, the office. Uh, but also, there is one uh, uh, additional language within within the, within that provision, which says, after the announcement of the result of the election, and that some uh, members of the of the constitutional uh, oversight commission 
uh, interpret this as that there is a slight possibility where election goes to the second round and the, the president-elect is not uh, yet known and uh, the current president can continue. It creates a legal limbo, it's not clear, uh, but the practice in the past has been that there being several delays uh, uh, in the timeline. That timeline, unfortunately, uh, several times been, uh, uh, been uh, uh, crossed and violated. Um, uh, everybody is expecting that uh, the procedure for adjudication of complaints for this round to be speeded up, and we, uh, as soon as possible, to have the final result. And in case there's a runoff, uh, the IEC uh, uh, time and again uh, uh, confirms and assured that uh, within 10 days to two weeks, they will be able to uh, uh, run again uh, the election. And the, the 10 days they say they need is for the ballot papers to be printed, to be uh, 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 dispatched to Kabul, and then to be distributed uh, to the stations for the operations. So it, it, there is a legal uh, 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 ambiguity there, and there will be a legal uh, crisis, but if the political uh, uh, agreement among the politicians allow the time to pass, uh, and in that one month or a few weeks uh, may uh, may be something uh, to be to be accepted, and this will become later on as a as a practice. But then everybody realizes that the constitution has a lot of issues and problems uh, that need to be addressed as soon as uh, the new uh, president takes the office. Uh, almost all of the frontliners could say constitutional reform will be one of their uh, 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 legislative agenda uh, as, as they take the office. I mean, let, me, let me add on this point just because uh, my understanding is, first of all, as I said, since no election has been held up to now on a constitutional time frame, we've faced this problem in every election and we faced it in 2009. And uh, for better or for worse, I think there is a Supreme Court precedent basically saying that the president who is in power, stays in power until the inauguration of the, of the next president. So this might not be as uh, contentious as an issue um, uh, as, as it could be, but I think uh, Nadra's absolutely right. It partly depends as well on the attitude of the, of the candidates, if they want to raise this challenge uh, or not. I think Jeremy Lewis. Back. Well, Uh, Maiwa Navid from the Defense Department. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for these insightful uh, presentations. Uh, secondly, it's worth noting that uh, the April 5th election was not only success for the Afghan people and the Afghan government, but it was a success for the international community. And democracy in Afghanistan is in the best interest of everyone in the region and around the world. Uh, in regard to um, the dynamic in Afghanistan, I'll go to uh, Shah Mahmoud Miakhel if he could answer me. Since um, you are on the ground in Kabul, uh, do you, uh, what do you think about the people? Do they see any uh, political change in regard to relationship between Kabul and Washington, D.C.? Do they think that the next president will probably change the relationship that Karzai have with DC uh, for the betterness of the people of Afghanistan. And secondly, in regard to the election and BSA, uh, well for President Karzai, he didn't sign the BSA because he thought that it will be a threat for his legacy. He didn't want that on his background. But the other candidates, they told us that they will sign the BSA once they become the president. But what assurances do we have that they will certainly sign the BSA? Because based on the Robert Gates book, yeah, he said there was an interference in 2009, and all these candidates were worried if they said, oh, we're not going to sign it, then the United States is not going to support them. So they said, yes, yeah, we will sign him, but once they become on that position, they might just say, hey, I'm not going to sign it, because if I sign them, it will be something like a Durand line agreement between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So uh, if some of the panel could answer those. Thank you so much. Good 
Thank you very much. Um, I believe uh, the relay because all the leading candidates repeatedly they said even yesterday, uh, Dr. Abdullah and also Ashraf Ghani, both in Wall Street Journal. You know, uh, I believe Ashraf Ghani just said is, uh, and within a week he will sign the DSA. You know, uh, and the relation will improve. The, uh, the reason is that because uh, so far, you know, Afghanistan, whoever is the next president. They need the support of international community for a long time, you know, uh, and that depends on the foreign assistance and support. So they will sign these things, and uh, without that, it's not possible to, you know, meet so many challenges in the country uh, of the running the government and also the uh, the people, you know, expectation they have from the next government. So that will happen. But uh, the comparison of this uh, agreement with the Duran line is a two different things. You know? uh, this is a not a uh, you know, land issue or is a not a border issue or something. It is a strategic relationship uh, uh, with the international community, especially the U.S. And it is all more, uh, you know, the U.S. have uh, this kind of uh, argument with so many other countries. Um, so I believe uh, it is, uh, if you look to the uh, lawyer jerga, you know, the uh, consultative lawyer jerga last year, uh, so uh, everybody, you know, uh, just uh, said it's to sign this. And also uh, uh, the strategic partnership was approved by the parliament of Afghanistan. I think there is no obstacle to sign the things, and also there is a need for that also. Amir, do you want to add something? Uh, just, a, just a quick point that I want to add on, 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 the, on the BSA. Uh, the, the president of Afghanistan, they, they, he didn't provide an alternative that if I'm not going to sign the BSA with uh, the U.S., I would have, because as you know, only if we put the development uh, like uh, cost aside, our a, Afghan National Security Forces, uh, we anticipate about five billion a year. And you will very well known that Afghan's economy is not strong enough to be able to do that. And Afghanistan doesn't have an alternative. And I don't think either of these two uh, leading candidates would want to be uh, the president of a bankrupt country. And this is a point that both of us, we uh, indicated in our recent peace and foreign policy. So I don't think they want to be the president of a bankrupt country. Jed, you also had a... Yeah, um, you know, I think, I think the... You know, there are, there are a number of scenarios by which, you know, the BSA will be signed, you know, and we've heard uh, recently that, you know, potentially it could be signed before the next president is, is sworn in. Um, and we've heard speculation, um, although, I, you know, you know w whether this would be, you know, binding, but we've heard speculation that, uh, that Karzai would simply have one of his ministers sign it um, prior to the president being sworn in. Um, I am skeptical that, I, I, I do think the next president will sign it if it, it will sign will agree to a bilateral security agreement with the United States uh, you know, if it's not done so uh, before that president is sworn in. But I don't think that's going to happen without conditions. Uh, I, I don't think that the next president of Afghanistan is going to want to come in immediately agree to an agreement that President Karzai took such a strong stand on. Mm, that's an interesting point. I think there's a question down here. And then. Can I add something from this point? Yeah, 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 go ahead. You know, uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, the leading, one of the leading candidates, you know, Ashraf, when he actually he negotiated, he said, so I think uh, it will be not that much, uh, you know, to talk about uh, reopen the negotiation again, it will prolong some things like that. Uh, I believe uh, the condition and, uh, you know, relationship, and everything, you know, is uh, defined, I think, in the DSA, and it will be a lot of that much problem, hopefully. Well, ho hopefully we'll see soon who's okay. right. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, um, oh. uh, actually, I just want to add up on that. Uh, I think when we had the, the consultative uh, jerga on the BSA, all the candidates were invited, and at least the three candidates who are uh, who are the the top candidates, uh, Dr. Zulmay Rasul, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, and Dr. Abdullah, all of them have publicly like endorsed that. And Dr. Ghani was a uh, member of the negotiation group with Dr. Zulmay Rasul, and Dr. Abdullah as opposition several times came in like uh, in, on public TV and asked the president to sign BSA. So at least these three top candidates, none of them are going to oppose that or in like, uh, or, or in like will not or would not in like say anything in terms of not signing that. But the other thing is also the public pressure. 
Mm. Now people have realized, in like all of us have realized the, the power of people. So then 4,000 people that they came together and they have actually endorsed the BSA. As soon as we have the election you know, process completed, that demand is going to be the first thing on the table to actually sign it. And one thing that we also have to remember that unlike Karzai, these people are not only like the only men in like running the show. All of them are having in their camps group that they have helped them with their campaign and they are accountable to them. And the groups that every one of them are having like are the ones who are for BSA. Some of them are even ministers of the current administration, some of them are outside the administration, but they are all the ones that you know, they are for BC and you know, they will definitely demand that the, the future president, if not signed by the current one, should sign that. But I'm sure also you heard, you heard the press conference that we had two days before, where actually the current Minister of Foreign Affairs said that he was very optimistic that actually president may sign it. So that is something that at least he promised. He said that you know, the work is going on and we are discussing, and there is very po high possibility of actually signing BSA before transfer of power to the next administration. Okay, so now we have three options. I personally don't think there is anything that actually the United States or us we have to be worried about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Faisal Ali Khan. I'm a Carnegie Fellow at the New America Foundation. Um, my one question is that one of, the, one of the campaigns was talking about direct election of governors in the provinces and districts, and were there any other, ca any other candidates that had any similar sort of ideas during that campaign? And the second one is that the parallel economy in Afghanistan, which is very strong, has access to capital, uh, access to markets, you know, financial transactions, it's creating job creation and things. Uh, what are some of the things that you saw that the campaign spoke about, about um, developing a strong domestic economy. And I just wanted to make a last, just a quick comment, because I've heard a couple of these Pakistan comments, uh, just to make the audience aware that there were 20 people killed in Islamabad today um, because of an attack that took place. Um, there have been over 50, 60,000 civilians who've died. I myself belong to a district where parliamentarians are threatened during their campaigns by anti-democratic forces, which is similar to the situation in Afghanistan. And I think alienating 180 million people um, who face the same issues um, instead of embracing some of the commonalities is something that can affect the stability. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Shamamu, did you, get, did you get the first two questions? <laughs> yeah, I just got it. You know, uh, it might be take a long time. Whatever, I don't know, who, which candidate said what, you know? But all of them, they talk about uh, economic, uh, you know, issues in the country, how to, you know, uh, you know, built uh, their own economy in the country, and at the same time, how to, you know, reach the regional, you know, dimension of the economy, and also beyond the region, for example, uh, to the distant neighbors, like, you know, how to have a better, you know, uh, relationship and also opportunity with the Central Asian country, with uh, Turkey in the Syria, you know, China is here, India, and also beyond that with the West, you know, they talk about uh, different modalities and different plan they have it. Uh, I think that guest can answer on this also because she worked in the Minister of Economy before, uh, Minister of Finance. But let me, Shaman, let me just ask a follow up. Yeah, but I'm not oh, a uh, candidate here. <laughs> can, 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 I, can, I, can, I, can I ask, can I ask just yeah. one follow up? Um, would, it, did the candidates campaign with a enough specificity about their programs to be able to differentiate? one from the other? Uh, or are the, is it just projections of personalities? And, and finally, also, could you change, uh, I, change the camera to uh, Shamamud? <laughs> as much yeah, as we okay. like to see you. Uh, I think in terms of, yeah, uh, in terms of their uh, manifesto, when we reviewed that, actually, to have any kind of like articulated program that you will be able to actually review and compare their manifesto in each of the program, whether we are talking about economic and if you are talking about social development or about good governance, there was not any kind of like that kind of program that they would kind of present it to people and people would review that and make that comparison. So I think that preparation was not there to be very honest to you. Uh, but generally, all of them were talking about fighting corruption, improving governance, and delegating some level of authority to provinces. Uh, there were, interestingly, Tolo TV actually arranged the last debate that was between the candidates. The three top candidates were invited. That was uh, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Zemaretou, and um, Dr. Ashavani. And uh, it was a two uh, hours of uh, debate. 
specifically on economical uh, issues, that they have to come and present their programs to people. Interestingly, neither Dr. Abdullah nor Dr. Zulmair Zul participated in the program. So two hours was there only for Ashraf Ghani. And of yeah. course, as a Minister of Finance, he had a very well-designed program in terms of economical development that he presented to people. And I believe he managed to bring, you know, like hundreds and millions of votes that night because he had two hours mm -hmm. nonstop to present his program to people. So he very clearly talked about, you know, how he's going to combat corruption, how he's going to prove governance, and what are the, some of the programs in the mining sector, uh, communication sector, construction sector that he's going to take to be able to actually like, bring a more uh, uh, economy and you know, economical opportunity for Afghanistan. And he also talked about uh, economical cooperation within the region and as well as with the, with, uh, with the international community. But the rest of the candidates, I uh, didn't have that kind of like, well-articulated program. Uh, that was beginning to sound like a campaign speech, uh, Nargis. <laughs> 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 well, one, one more thing oh, yeah. is, I think one of the reasons uh, among the other, um, uh, I'm not part of the, any campaign, uh, just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but just, just uh, something that uh, uh, even this was discussed among the uh, civil society members and, and uh, maybe most of the active uh, civil society youth groups as well, that uh, most of these candidates, they didn't have um, a specific, uh, I mean, uh, technical understanding of the economic issues in Afghanistan and at the regional level. That's why uh, even on that night when there was a, a, a debate going on, this was kind of a funny way that there was no debate. There was only one person was talking and talking because uh, they were calling it debate, but this was not debate. That's why I think uh, one of the reasons that uh, I would uh, I, I would call uh, is the lack of the um, technical knowledge about the economic issues as well as about the um, understanding of the, uh, the regional uh, economic as well as the national economic issues. Okay, thanks. I think we're going to maybe take two more questions and then have a, have a round up here. There's a question in the back and then in the front. Uh, my name is Javed Ahmed. I'm with the General Marsh Fund of the United States. I have uh, two quick questions. One uh, is, in the event that the election does get into a runoff, uh, which seems likely, do you foresee any last-minute coalition buildings or backdoor deals or any sort of possible concessions by any of the candidates? And secondly, um, now that uh, President Karzai has proved many of his critics wrong, although the uh, election results have yet to be seen, do you, or how do you foresee his role in post-April political dispensation in Kabul, especially given, or if his uh, alleged loyalist Rasul doesn't win? Thanks. Uh, did you get that in Kabul? I think the question was about in like uh, runoff, second runoff, and the yeah, second well, one was about rule of President Karzai after election, right? Right, right. Or after the new administration. Right. Communications with me? Yeah. yeah. I will just, you know, the politics is always about coalition building, reaching to each other, and all these things, you know? So I believe uh, that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, in terms of who journey with who, who support each other. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far as if you look, you know, the surveys, if you just look to the surveys, you know, the latest surveys, uh, the two are the leading candidates. And they have a broader appeal to the people. And uh, I think people will vote again, uh, you know, on the way they want it. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, President Karzai, you know, both of the candidates, you know, especially the leading candidates, they just see they will have some role to play in the future. But we don't know exactly what will be that role. Uh, and uh, this is also very important, you know, a sitting president, you know, leave the office and have a better, you know, life or play a role in the future. So this will be the good uh, precedent, you know, in the future for other presidents. Uh, and so they should not, you know, because if you just go to the history of Afghanistan, since the year of the Raman Khan, you know, uh, so all the presidents were killed or uh, expelled or... Uh, you know, removed from the offices, you know. Uh, so this will be the first time in history that this has happened. 
and the credit will some credit will go to the credit from Kazai also. You know, nobody can deny that also, and he will have some role in the future. Okay. Any reactions here? Or? Kai, you have a, intru introduce yourself. Kai Aydan from Norway. Uh, I worked in uh, Afghanistan for a few years. Um, Scott, would you permit a comment before the question? Um, How can I say no? <laughs> first on the BSA, I, I would not be surprised if uh, Karzai in fact signs the BSA. I think it's not an unlikely scenario. Uh, let's wait and see. Uh, second, when it comes to the relationship to the United States, I think it's very important to remember there are two sides to this. Huh? It's not only the Afghan government and the difficult Karzai in inverted commas. Uh, it, both sides have to push the reset button if this is going to work. And I think Bob, Bob Gates outlines the problems here very well in his recent book on this particular point. Then, of course, there are great expectations of these elections, which I do believe really uh, has been a success in so many ways. But not everything has changed in Afghanistan because of these elections. Uh, what has happened is that a new basis has probably been created for addressing some of the most pressing challenges, corruption, uh, role of women, etc. And I think now it's up to civil society, in particular in Afghanistan, to use that new basis. But it's also up to the international community to see that there is now a new basis established, and please let's not let Afghanistan down, but pursue our efforts of support as strongly as we can. That was my little comment, okay? Uh, and then my question, and that has to do with Ashraf Ghani's choice of Dostum as his vice presidential candidate. How has that been seen, in particular among the young urban populations and voters? And secondly, how do you see it affect if Ashraf Ghani should be elected? How do you see that we affect his credibility and his ability to conduct the process of reform that he has been advocating. Thank you. Okay, reactions first from Kabul. Yeah, I think it is a high Kai, it is a very difficult question, you know, <laughs> uh, because uh, I will not, no, I will not, uh, you know, to answer on his behalf what he just think, but uh, people of Afghanistan, you know, young, old, women, you know, educated, uneducated people, all of these people, you know, they, came out and they voted. And I was uh, in very remote provinces like in Kunar, uh, Paktia, and Herat, uh, and you know, some other parts of the country. And I saw the enthusiasm of the, you know, people. You know, in my presentation, I mentioned the, as far as the, you know, result we see, you know, especially in my own province, I see it. They rejected the status quo. And also, they rejected the old guards, you know, uh, what do you call the, the, the leaders, you know, or the power brokers, or whatever you call it, warlords, or whatever. Uh, those who, you know, dominated Afghanistan politics uh, in the last 30 years, you know. So people wanted some change, and that change mostly happened with the leading two candidates, you know, either Abdullah or Dr. Ashavani. And people know who their vice president is because each one has a different, you know, uh, people around themselves. But, you know, in Afghanistan, is, this is another one transition. We will go towards stability, improve governance, and have a confidence of the people on the uh, political institution and government institution and security institution. So that confidence is a big issue, uh, which will hopefully be built on this momentum, you know, in the next... Uh, you know, a few days or a few weeks or months or years uh, coming, you know. Uh, so now this show, you know, because in Afghanistan there was another issue uh, before the election. Uh, you know, there was a many assumptions, okay, whoever the U.S. supporting or, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe, you know, President Karzai or government will interfere or something. But, you know, I wrote a piece in foreign policy on April 1st. 
And I, when I saw the enthusiasm of the people uh, during the campaigns, so I just said, you know, it is not possible to rig this election to the extent it is possible, like 2009. The government machinery is divided and everybody, you know, the sitting president is not running. So there were so many differences between 2009 and 2014. Then I see the maturity of the people. Uh, you know, you cannot believe it. There are more mature people in the rural areas than most of our elites, uh, you know, uh, sitting in Kabul or in other places. Okay. I think, David, you had a two-finger uh, comment. Yes. Najla would like to also, oh. uh, Najla would like to add a point. You know? Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, as Miracle uh, said mentioned, it's a bit uh, difficult question, but uh, still I have a little bit different view uh, uh, compared with uh, Miracle said, because uh, in many cases uh, you can see that this is the reality of our country, because we have all of these um, Let's say we are calling them wallers or maybe influential people by any means in the in the society. They have their role, uh, and, and this is the reality. We have to accept this first of all. But the second is uh, Dostum was pushed by uh, Ghani uh, that he should say uh, he should apologize from the apology from what he has done in the past. Uh, to the people of Afghanistan, which at the first place, this was a little bit negative um, uh, 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 use, and, and, and people were have uh, had a little bit negative uh, perceptions about why uh, Mr. Ghani uh, chose uh, uh, Dostum as the vice president. But later on, when he apologized from the people, then this was um, a kind of a good sign for the people, which this is also something that we have to realize that this happened in the first time ever in the history of the conflict in Afghanistan, that someone without any uh, pressure or any, uh, I mean, um, any, any, uh, uh, any uh, accountability uh, or maybe any, any, uh, account uh, any mechanism that make them accountable, he is coming in and uh, saying apologies to the people, what he has done. But the, the third thing is that, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Ghani uh, uh, might lose all, already some of the support from the other uh, ethnicities, uh, mainly because uh, Mr. Dostum is representing one of the uh, third uh, majority, or fourth majority of the population in Afghanistan. But still, this is something that we have to realize that this is the reality of the country. But uh, we'll see what will happen after the, the results. Okay. Um, uh, I just want oh. to add on that. Yeah. I think two things that uh, in this election, once again, we observe. Uh, first of all, about the role of many people uh, and those that in like whether we call them warlords, leaders, in like Mujahideen, whoever, uh, that some of them became quite irrelevant. And this election proved that. Uh, for example, Sayof was someone that always in like he was putting pressure on the administration and he was quite influential, claiming that in like he has followers. But by in like running this time for the election and having the percentage of vote, he proved himself that in like he is not relevant anymore in the society. There were many other rest of them that actually like they were claimed to be quite relevant and in like having their own followers, but this election proved that actually they are not relevant anymore. Only in case of those I must say that in other ethnicities, if you look at Pashtun, Tajiks and Hazaras, at least in the last uh, 10 to 12 years, there, uh, there have been many other leaders that they have grown up, they have come out, they have, uh, and, uh, and, and they have begun to lead their people and represent them. So people have, people have like, better choices. But when we compare that to the case of Uzbeks, we see that still we have, uh, we have not been able to at least have those prominent new leaders that they would, they would, they would come on board and elect people those that would see that you know, these people are, are, are better choices for us and they can represent us so that then they could have joined some of these tickets. Only Sharonis families was there, but they are not that influential. The other thing that also those some did, actually, I think he was quite uh, smart in terms of like, playing politics, that uh, as soon as the process of election, in, like, uh, even before startup, 
he brought together all Uzbeks, including like uh, uh, educated and non-educated, all those that are relevant, including Minister of Public Health, some of the deputy ministers, all of them, and told them that we have to stay united and we have to claim our right, right in like from our ethnicity right from the uh, from these candidates. So that in itself, when brought them together, actually made him quite influential. Of course, many many people were very disappointed when they saw that combination, but at the same time, when the whole lab, the uh, the whole um, uh, campaign started, everybody got so campaigned that actually who, maybe one of us forgot that actually who was in whose second, because it was not only Ghani, actually, the other candidates also. We had Dr. Abdullah that he also has Muqaqat in his group, Ahab Ashraf Ghani has Dostum in his group, but at the same time, we have Zulmai Rasul, who has actually nobody strong, and that kind of personality in his group. So it's a kind of, like, it was not a kind of, like, we didn't have, a, I think people didn't have kind of, like, better choices. That's why many people went on and they, they supported. And many influential people like um, uh, um, uh, Dr. Ahadi's uh, uh, political party, uh, no, Mansoor Naudiri's political party, and many of them later on, actually, by all those campaigns, they decided that they will join uh, his group. So I think Uzbek's case was quite different in comparison to Pashtun's project and Hazara's defense in terms of leadership. So those them are the only leaders that they have. Okay. We're, since we're, we're, we're running out of time, I wanted to give David a quick comment, and then I think we'll go through the back through the panel here in, in Washington and then wrap it up and allow you and Kabul to finally have dinner. But uh, David, you had a two-finger comment. My quick comment is that uh, one person who I think, based on everything to date, deserves great credit and high praise and is not getting it is President Hamid Karzai. One year ago, two years ago, inside the government, outside the government, in panels such as this, people were confidently predicting that President Karzai would manipulate the elections, uh, that they would be a failure, uh, that he would uh, choose his candidate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think all of us heard those criticisms. To date, uh, President Karzai has not lived down to those expectations. Rather, he has exceeded them. He has exceeded them in an exceptional way. My own hope, and I expect the hope of many, is that President Karzai's crowning achievement uh, will be the way in which he transfers power to his successor. Uh, and along the way, however, I think it is important to give him credit for what he has done up until now and trust that he will continue on the same path. Thank you. That also sounds like a campaign speech, but... Uh... <laughs> uh, I mean... It's, I think, important to remember that where Afghanistan was uh, 12 years ago, uh, then it was like a safe haven uh, to terrorism and an isolated country. But during the past uh, 12 years, you know, we have come a long, a long way. You know, in any aspects that you measure Afghanistan politically, economically, socially, uh, you see improvement and development. Often our national security advisor refers to Afghanistan as a lamb among the wolves. So uh, we are really, really hopeful and optimistic. Uh, we are counting on international security, uh, international community uh, not to uh, uh, abandon Afghanistan at such a critical stage, which I don't hopefully anticipate such a scenario. Afghans are often saying that, you know, we want to be the next um, South Korea in our region. We do not want to be uh, uh, Iraq or another uh, Somalia. So we really hope that that path continues and that we build on, on the recent success in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, you know, it, it's, it's really important, I think, that we recognize, uh, you know, how much work is left to be done. I think right now what's important in, in Afghanistan is that both the IEC and the IECC be given the space that they need to conduct their job uh, independently and impartially. Um, and that the candidate campaigns have uh, patience with the process as well. Um, and just to, to, uh, to expand off of, of what you said, Hamid, uh, you know, we have uh, you know, not often talked about democracy as an area where Afghanistan has made progress, and uh, this election, I hope, uh, is, is another important step forward uh, to uh, democracy and, and the democratic uh, process in Afghanistan becoming a strength. Uh, you know, this is the fifth nat national election uh, that's been held, the first that, you know, managed entirely um, by Afghan leadership, uh, the first election that's been managed under an election law, an electoral framework that was democratically adopted uh, through a legislative process, uh, and, a, and a, a robust campaign process, and, and enthusiasm amongst uh, all uh, uh, aspects of society to participate in the process, uh, and more than anything, a broad respect uh, for democratic elections uh, and for democracy uh, as the path to power. 
And, and, you know, Jed mentioned the election is not over. Um, we still have a tallying, a tallying process and a, and a complaints process coming up and continued observation of, of, of those processes is going to be very important because, you know, the election, the, well, all the good that uh, is uh, sort of developed on election day could still be potentially undermined if, if uh, the rest of the process goes poorly. Um, secondly, th th there's a, another election here, which is the election of the provincial councils that no one's really talked about. And there are going to be, you know, there were elections in all 34 provinces for 400 and some uh, provincial councillors. Uh, so there's going to be a transition occurring there as well. I think in 2010, something like 70 percent, was about, perhaps a bit more, of all the, the, the councillors were newly elected. Um, so there'll be a lot of people likely coming into government that have never served before. And uh, some attention, I think, needs to be uh, uh, paid to them as well. That's the only subnational elective uh, bodies in Afghanistan, and um, they've tended to be neglected uh, in previous years, but um, hopefully they'll play a, a stronger role in the future. Thanks. And then I'll, let me just make the final comment. I think that for, for as much as we know that the election is not over and many things can still go wrong, um, I don't mind taking a few days to feel a little bit optimistic and a little bit gratified uh, about what happened on Saturday. Uh, in 2009, when I was working for Kai, who I remember very well, we had about 10 minutes of satisfaction the election had been concluded before all of the bad news started rolling in. And this time, five years ago, was the beginning of four months of um, real uh, uh, hell in trying to sort out uh, the mess that that election made. I will say that, you know, for all of the failures of 2009, the success was that um, the constitutional order was preserved, the institutions solved the electoral mess, however inelegantly, however difficultly, and that, I think, prepared a lot of the ground for what happened um, uh, on Saturday. I think a lot of lessons were learned uh, and learned correctly um, by a lot of actors, by candidates, by the IEC, by the government, by observers, um, and so forth. For, for, for USIP, I thank all of those of you who, who pointed out the role that we've been playing. I think it's you know, more than two and a half years ago we began focusing on these elections and trying to make sure that the attention in Washington, um, if it was not constantly focus on the elections was sufficiently focused and understood the importance that these, uh, uh, these events will have. So I thank you know, all of you who've been involved for your support, all of you who've been coming to these events uh, and, and, and paying attention. Uh, I want to thank uh, Shah Mahmood uh, not, and, 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 and your panelists, not just for participating today, but, all, sorry? <laughs> but also for, for all of the work that's been done in the last several years uh, on the ground as you know, civil society activists, um, as analysts coming here to tell us what's going on, uh, obviously, as everybody said, this is a you know, great credit uh, for Afghan voters, for Afghan democracy activists, and, and I think we all appreciate the role that you've been played. And then finally, thanks to all of you who, who showed up this morning. Sorry for going uh, over time. This will not be the last discussion of this event. It may, not, it may be the most optimistic discussion of, uh, of these elections, uh, but we will uh, have more events trying to understand, and as, as, as this um, process unfolds, it will hopefully lead to uh, the first peaceful and democratic transition of power uh, in Afghanistan's long, long history. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, uh, panelists here, uh, and uh, especially in Kabul, uh, for staying up so late. Um, thanks.